What is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. Today's video, we're going to be talking about X-Men number 15 by Jerry Duggan and Joshua Kassara. And in this video, I'm going to be breaking down exactly how the children of the vault are a lot more than just a mutant problem. And we're also finally going to get an answer as to what the secret project that Charles Xavier and Forge have been working on called Project Black Box. You can't see me, you Stevie, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie and make it look easy. Okay, so when we pick this issue up, we learn the fruits of Project Black Box, the secret project Forge was working on when he was elected to become a member of this year's iteration of the X-Men at Hellfire Gala number one just a couple of months ago. We didn't really have any inclination as to what Project Black Box was or any idea of when we would find out exactly what the hell it is. And when that issue came out, I posited that maybe Project Black Box was something along the lines of a type of device that would allow the mutants to rebuild Krakoa in the wake of an extinction level event or in the wake of some temporal event that changed the timeline. They would be able to use this black box in some way to figure out what happened in either of those cases. And there was even a little bit of musing about some kind of psionic chicanery. That said, I was way off the mark with what it was that Project Black Box is. What we learn is that it's basically the Krakoan version of the Matrix. This is a type of techno-organic device that once implemented is able to pacify the children of the vault. The very same vault that we saw Sink, Wolverine, and Darwin enter back in Jonathan Hickman's X-Men number five. Forge has placed Project Black Box around the vault in an effort to keep the children of the vault from ever getting out. For those unfamiliar, the children of the vault are post-humans who are genetically modified with over the course of hundreds if not thousands of years because inside the vault there is a sort of temporal distortion where time moves completely different and much faster than it does outside of it. We saw during Jonathan Hickman's X-Men that when Darwin, Sink, and Wolverine were in the vault, while it had probably only been over the course of a few days to a week that they had been gone, in reality, they were actually there for 500 years. And while their powers had grown and changed in all kinds of crazy ways, so too did the post-humans, turning them into these, and to steal a phrase from Rob of Comics Explained, these beyond Omega level entities. Project Black Box is a way of keeping them contained as they try to escape the vault and go out into the world and wreak havoc. Project Black Box is built to contain them in such a way that it puts them inside these Krakoan cocoons, not that dissimilar from what you would see the machines keep humans inside of in the Matrix. Now, you're probably wondering if they've created this black box to keep the post-humans in, what happens for anyone that tries to go in that might be a mutant? Would it attack a mutant if they went through? Well, this technology that created the black box is very similar to the technology that created the Krakoan gates. Only mutants can go in and out of the black box. Anything other than that is trapped within. The same as how humans can't use the Krakoan gates unless they are either allowed to or are accompanied by another mutant. And inside these cocoons, they're held with inside of a simulation, one that is so real that they have no idea that they're in a simulation. In this simulation, they have run roughshod across the world, taking out not just the mutants, but proving that the post-humans don't really actually care about humanity. They actually care more about just getting rid of everybody and making all that is in the world that exists post-human. Because as Forge mentions earlier in the comic when it's all believed that this is stuff that's actually happened, this is all part of the simulation. That when the post-humans escape the vault, they destroy Krakoa in less than a day of leaving the door of the vault, wiping Krakoa off the face of the planet. And when they did that, they weren't done. They went on to take on the Avengers, which I do want to put a little interesting postscript here. I do find it funny, you know, this book is depicting the post-humans, the children of the vault, taking down 
the Avengers, yet the Avenger that is depicted as being taken down in this issue is not the Robbie Reyes version of Ghost Rider who is actually currently on the Avengers. It seems to be the Johnny Blaze version of Ghost Rider who is not an Avenger currently. Though I guess technically he's an Avenger by way of the fact that he has been an Avenger in the past, but I found it interesting that this was the one that they chose to go with. They've also taken down Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four, who are technically humans, not normal humans. They are uh, technically meta humans, you know, enhanced individuals or whatever, but they take out Marvel's first family, killing Reed, the Thing, Human Torch, and Invisible Woman without so much as batting an eyelash. Even the mystic arts community, and more specifically, Clea Strange and Doctor Doom, who have had some words as of late in Jed McKay's Strange series right now, and they are some of the last to fall. At least as far as, you know, humans, you know, technically go. And the Children of the Vault don't stop there either. They move on to not just wreak havoc across the mystic arts community, but even going as far as Asgard, killing every single Asgardian in that realm, as well as the mighty Allfather himself, Thor. Now, this information is not just something Forge is keeping to himself. Forge has had a very antagonistic relationship with Cyclops since before even joining the team, and a lot of that is largely due to the fact that he feels that Cyclops snitched on the mutant community. But one of the things I feel, and it's something I've constantly reiterated, and I'm glad that Jerry Doug is actually bringing it up here, and I don't see any reason why he wouldn't, because for all intents and purposes, Jerry Duggan is also writing all the rest of these issues that all this stuff took place. But the thing is, Forge is constantly hounding Cyclops at every turn about snitching on the X-Men secret of mutant resurrection, even in this issue saying, hey, don't go running off to Ben Urich and flapping your gums about this state secret that you know we're trying to put together, and also even throwing his face that this is why you were never put on the Quiet Council because you are too much of a Boy Scout to do the things that they're trying to do. Now granted, this in and of itself is a part of the simulation Forge telling Cyclops about all this, but it does also happen again later in the real world, and it goes about roughly the same way. And Cyclops has about roughly the same answer I've always given when people have criticized Cyclops' decision to tell Ben Yurik about the mutant resurrection process, it's that humans already knew about it, and it was the bad humans, the ones that are trying to kill them and exterminate them, if he wouldn't have put the secret out there, they would have done it and made things even worse for how humans perceive mutants. So if anyone was going to do it, I mean, Cyclops may as well have done it before Orcus or Xeno would have. But you're probably sitting here thinking, okay, well, they built the simulation to keep the children of the vault from getting free, allowing them to think that they've taken over the world and destroyed everybody. Okay, so what's the point? The point is, is that, and I feel Forge has you know, come to this conclusion as well, is that they can't kill the children of the vault, at least not in the way that I think a lot of people think that they should do it. Because as we saw in the simulation, Forge had built what is essentially a singularity cannon, a giant gun that fires off a black hole at the Children of the Vault's vault. One that would suck the Children of the Vault into that singularity and trap them in the great unknown. And it didn't work. And I can tell you the reason why I think it didn't work, and it's because ever since Jonathan Hickman's X-Men number 19, we saw that Darwin was lost to the vault. When Wolverine and Singh tried to make their valiant escape, Darwin was captured, and what I believe happened is that Darwin's powers were very likely being harnessed by the children of the vault, allowing them to add it to their power set, which is making them capable of adapting to just about any situation that possibly comes up. Hence why I believe the children of the vault were completely unaffected by that singularity, because one of them actually mentions it did actually work. The gun didn't misfire. It actually shot. The problem is that in this simulation, the gun actually went off long before the Children of the Vault ever actually showed up in this particular moment. It actually shot long ago, and Forge just never realized it for one reason or another. This is why they're actually not trying to actively kill them. It's not necessarily because they're technically human. I'm sure that actually factors into it, but as we have seen in the cases of MODOK, and even in the cases of what Darwin, Wolverine, and Sink had to do in the Vault itself, they killed plenty of post-humans. Post-humans are changed just enough that they're not technically humans anymore, so they don't count towards Krakoa's arbitrary rule of kill no man. So in that regard, the children of the vault have become that much stronger, and very likely it is all thanks to Darwin being left behind in the vault. And when you think about the fact that Darwin was left there, it was 500 years 
for a character like Sink, who was trapped in the vault, and he still has knowledge of those 500 years. So imagine if Darwin still being in the vault, he's likely been in there for a thousand or more years since Sink escaped. And it hasn't even been that long, in the outside world at least. Another interesting thing about this issue is that Jean actually catches wind of something that Forge has also done outside of Project Black Box, something that's completely separate and is incredibly problematic when you really think about it. But it's also not surprising considering how Forge tends to operate. Jean takes notice of the fact that another piece of Krakoan tech Forge is using is this suit, this Krakoan outfit that almost kind of looks like a Krakoan hazmat suit but it's actually something more. The suit is hinted at having some kind of a temporal dampener when it's joked that when he goes into the vault, he's gonna come out 500 years older or more, possibly, depending on how long he's in there. He throws out a comment about how the suit has more tricks up its sleeve and kind of implies that he won't age as a result of going into the vault. Another trick of the suit is that it also is spliced with Mystique's DNA, something that Gene picks up on. This suit allows him to take on the guise of one of the post-humans so that he can blend in with the rest of the children of the vault and walk around unnoticed. And Forge is able to take on the guise of the post-human Paro. And granted, he ends up not even actually really needing it because it seems like all of the children of the vault have been put inside of containment, at least the ones who tried to escape, of which there were five. That's not the only other thing we learn. Once he drops the guise of Paro, we discover that the X on his chest that is very reminiscent of the old X-Men costumes from back in like the late 70s, early 80s. We discover that X actually is more than just an X. This is actually the mutant Caliban. Caliban has been molded into Forge's suit somehow. And the way that Caliban talks about it, he mentions not being able to feel his body or his legs or anything like that, which implies that his head was decapitated from his body somehow. In a way that kind of eerily reminds me as I've been going back and rereading the Mark Wade run on Daredevil, there's actually a set of issues. I forget exactly which one, but I'll try to remember to put a, a note here about it. But there was a particular issue where something very similar happens to Daredevil, where his head is detached from his body by way of using Coyote's ability to create portals. And Daredevil is able to still be alive, not be in any actual pain, but his head is not connected to his body and is completely separate. This is kind of the situation I think that is going on here, but in the case of Caliban and much like in the case of Daredevil in that particular issue, this is not of his own free will. He even mentions that the last thing he remembers is having a drink in the Red Lagoon with Forge, which for clarification, the Red Lagoon is basically the bar that is very similar to the Green Lagoon of Krakoa. It's the bar that's on Araco. But Caliban has no memory of any of this, and he is very likely an unwilling participant in all of this. The question is, why does Forge have Caliban fused to his suit? What purpose would he serve? For those unfamiliar with the character of Caliban, he is a character whose mutant power is to be able to detect the X factor, the X gene in other mutants. He can detect an X gene in a 25 mile radius of himself. And if the mutant is particularly powerful, he can detect at even greater range. This is to help facilitate Forge going into the vault by himself, more or less, and finding Darwin so they can get him out. And while some think, well, why didn't they just resurrect Darwin? The problem with that is there is actually a rule about the resurrection protocols that states that no mutant can be resurrected without proof of death. And the last time Sink saw Darwin, he was still very much alive, even though he was literally being tortured almost half to death when they were seemingly harnessing his powers. So they don't even know if Darwin is alive or dead, so they're not going to resurrect him if they don't actually know that he's dead. So this is why they're staging this assault going back into the vault. But I can definitely say this, this isn't the milk run that Forge wants you to believe it is because one of the children of the vault, at the very least, is very much alive. At this precise moment, one of the children of the vault, Serafina, is watching him. So it's become obvious at this point, whatever it was the Project Black Box was supposed to do, it didn't actually do everything that it needed to do. It didn't get all of the remaining post-children as, once again, it only captured five of them. And while typically whenever the children of the vault are around, we only really ever focus on like five or six of them, there's actually hundreds upon thousands of them. So why Forge dropped his Paro disguise is beyond me. He should have kept it. 
if we're being brutally honest with ourselves. That said, I'm actually really impressed that we finally got the answer to what exactly is Project Black Box. It is definitely something I wasn't 100% certain of and it completely surprised me. I really was in the wrong direction when I mused about what it was. And honestly, at that point, we really had nothing to go on except a name. There really wasn't any further information out there about it. So I mean, it was one of those things I was like, sure, okay, this is the most obvious thing that it could potentially be. And it wasn't. Though I will say, I feel that while Project Black Box was being kept very close to the chest by both Charles, Xavier, and Forge, I can't help but feel as though it was the other things that Forge had in his possession. Once again, the Mystique DNA that was used to create the suit that would allow him to change his appearance the same way that Mystique does, which honestly, I'm not surprised he has that DNA. They did have a relationship together for quite some time. Forge strikes me as the type of guy who would have a keepsake. Or he may have asked Mystique for this DNA and just took it that way, who knows? But uh, the whole deal with Caliban doesn't really surprise me as much. Because once again, I know sometimes Forge has been depicted outside of comics as being this lovable, affable person, but Forge is, in the comics, he is a whole son of a bitch. It's kind of like with Beast, like everyone thinks, oh, Beast is so nice and cuddly and kind because you probably watch the X-Men animated series and that's all you really know about Beast. But no, Beast is actually quite a terrible person. Scientist in the Marvel Comics universe, I think scientists in general in comics, but in the Marvel Comics universe especially, I feel like most scientists, the characters that see themselves as being super science guys, you can usually bank on at least eight out of 10 of them being complete and total douchebags. But anyways, that's everything I wanted to talk about with X-Men number 15, this issue was fantastic. And I'm curious to see how terrible Forge is about to catch it in the vault, though I have a feeling he's gonna have more tricks up his sleeve than what we've seen up to this point. He has already said that suit could do a lot more than what it says on the tin, and yeah, we'll just have to wait and see what it is. I'm more curious to see what Darwin's reaction is going to be once he is found, or if he's even still alive. I assume he is, because his powers make it virtually impossible for him to be killed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. He has survived some of the craziest things ever in life, even at one point in time, becoming a god when being struck by Hela's death touch. So I don't think he's gone, but part of me wonders whether or not he's gonna hold a grudge about being left and for how long. But in the meantime, if you wanna know more about the character Darwin, check out this video here where I break down everything you need to know about the unkillable mutant. And if you wanna know more about Sink, Darwin, and Wolverine's journey into the vault, check out this video down here. In the meantime, let me know what you thought about X-Men number 15. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.